been trying to keep up with the Ghost Recon community since I haven't played the game games in a while. But uh, I was watching a YouTuber by the name of G Money Mozart, who's a big, big. Well, I don't know if he's big as an audience size, but he mostly does Ghost Recon stuff. And he put out a video because apparently people are having issues with Breakpoint again, despite the fact that Ubisoft has stopped all support. Um, because... Oh, is it, am I only getting audio in one ear? No, we're getting it in both ears. Uh, people are experiencing a bug that happened a long time ago where the first slot in in their save data, like their characters, are inexplicably gone. And he told us how to back up our save data, so I'm like, uh, thank God. Because, um... You know, they got rid of the, the, the Terminator event, which that's not that big of a deal. It's just pretty much just like, well, as long as I can keep my main character, I think I'll be okay. Because you can't get that stuff anymore. Breakpoint is broken. Yeah. This is a relatively new thing, as in, you know, was occurring this week, but G Money Mozart put out a video saying how we can back up our save data. But anyways, um, as I was saying, losing the character is not the big deal. The big deal is they got rid of the Terminator event, which meant that we can keep our items, but we cannot get the items anymore so while the terminator items are like the least the least priority items it's also kind of like uh i i did that i deserve to keep it and i shouldn't have to lose it because ubisoft can't you know keep their servers intact with our save data on them and and it all boils down to you know? Oh, that's already clean. It boils down to, again, always online. Which... Most of the time, always online is not that big of a deal, but when there's problems, it seems like it's, like, really, really bad problems. So many people who haven't streamed in a while are coming back at the same time right now. Staying here, though. Well, I appreciate that, but you're free to go whenever you want. Last thing I want people to do is feel like they're expected to be here. I want people to join out of the volition of their own will. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask this question, since you said a bunch of streamers are back that haven't streamed in a while. Is Charmed back today? Or is he still dealing with tech issues? No. Aw. Sad. That and, of course, more mods are coming out for Breakpoint. The Wildlands modding scene, I think, is... Not that the modding scene for either game is all that really happening, but the Wildlands modding scene seems to have slowed down some. And for the most part, the mods for Wildlands were mostly just... Um... Get this golf ball out of the corner. 
were just reshade presets. Like, there's the whole first person mod and all that, but. Oh, I see. There we go. Is there mods? Yes, there are a... one or two mods for Wildlands, and there's quite a few mods for Breakpoint. You can find them on nexusmods.com. Like, there's the whole Spartan mod, which is a complete gameplay overhaul. It does require you to uninstall BattleEye and to put in a special uh, code in your Ubisoft launcher and then to also run Cheat Engine. But it's a single player mod which makes the game harder. Like technically it's using cheats to do that, but it, it, it makes it more immersive and it, it's quite fun. Very difficult, but quite fun. It's difficult in all the right ways. Mmm, see, that's the problem. <laughs> it doesn't work on console. If it worked on console, it would have to be first party, which it's very much not. In fact, there was a newish mod I found for Ghost Recon Breakpoint because I think uh, G Money Mozart showed it on his channel. And that requires the Anvil Toolkit, which somebody released on on Nexus, which is allowing people to pretty much use, you know, Ubisoft Engine tools to make mods. Just, once again, the modding scene for Ghost Recon is, n well, at least for Wildlands and Breakpoint, I don't know, I don't know about the other games. The modding scene for those games is very small, especially in comparison to something like Skyrim, which is... Literally the biggest modding scene on Nexus. It's literally the biggest game on Nexus. Skyrim Special Edition, which is only seconded by Skyrim... The original Skyrim. Watch Gamers Nexus and Hardware Unbox to get an idea of how different processors and graphics cards compare to each other. Gonna get a PC soon, looking for a good one, but I'm a bit lost. Yeah, I definitely watch Gamers Nexus. Um, they're, they're pretty good on the tech stuff. Might be a little, might be a little too much if you don't know what you're, what, what the language is. Like, like, not, not like English or whatever, but like, like tech language. Like, what, what words mean things when people are talking about different pieces of hardware. Because I certainly don't know all the, all the tech words. So, um, I'm sure Kitty will definitely be able to, uh answer any questions because they're pretty knowledgeable on that stuff I'll, uh, I'll read your other comment here kitty in a moment if you're not scared to do so try building it yourself you're likely to save some money doing so seems like reshade's introductions of add-ons allows you to do some really powerful stuff with it might see a resurgence in presets yeah, I think I might try a preset for Wildlands, but I'm going to revert my breakpoint to be without a uh, reshade preset. It just, you know, between streaming and recording, you know, both at different levels of quality, and then also using reshade, I, think, I don't think my computer could handle it. I'd be pushing it to the limit every time. And that what that means is I, I'll either lose FPS in game, or my stream will lag because my encoder is overloaded. I'll get that rust off in a moment. Hit you up on lose Discord if you have questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Might build it yourself and get help from a friend. As long as the parts ship to Sweden, I'll be fine. They sh should. If it's anything like Finland, it might take a while. But we've been deep into Skyrim lately. I do want to get back to Ghost Recon. And I'm half tempted to just lock in the next big game we play um, after Skyrim being Ghost Recon Wildlands. 
So I really want to get back to it. It, it it's like I, 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 I don't think I appreciate appreciated how good of a game it is. You know, in the past, I always recognized that it was a pretty good game, especially compared to Breakpoint. But it's it's pretty darn good. I, I've had a bit of a resurgence in the uh, my appreciation for it. Are you saying you don't want a subatomic particle accelerator in your basement? I'm gonna work on the wall here. It's not necessarily about wants, more like will the government knock down your door or not, right? They're overpriced here in Sweden. Might drop a message before I buy the parts. Yeah, so you don't accidentally buy a particle accelerator. Wow, chat is just moving really fast today. I'm losing a lot of messages. PC hardware here in Bulgaria has been historically overpriced. But they shipped X place what the final price will be. Overpriced in Sweden. You're the one with the particle accelerator. <laughs> Not used to chat moving that quick, so I gotta be on my toes. This, uh, this level is very thematic, because we've been on a very, very medieval kick lately, especially with Skyrim. So this, this being a mini golf course, and then of course the music we're playing... Like, I'm very tempted to make Wildlands the next game we play on stream after we finish our Skyrim run, which that's going to take a while. We're playing super slow, and uh, we're already like 23 episodes of full stream VODs on YouTube. And uh, I am still in Whiterun. but I love playing super slow. It was 100% just a big tube with hot cocoa. Yeah, hot cocoa. I forgot how annoying it was to have the delay from watching streams on mobile. Yeah, it's uh, not great, is it? Let's see, I did the arrow. And of course, this game got plenty of updates. Got one just this month, actually. But it's worth it watching while cleaning the apartment. Cleaning the apartment while watching someone clean something. Very, very on point. <laughs> I've heard someone joke that they would, that people would rather uh, play Power Wash Simulator than clean their apartment or house or whatever. Pretty funny.
gonna get like gonna get like on the wall over here. There we go. Also, if I'm not talking, it's simply because, uh, I'm taking a moment to relax. This game is very relaxing, after all. It is very relaxing. Like, th to the point where I'll be editing a video. For, like, just to kind of cut out the breaks, cut out the the stream intro. To just have a simple block of uh, unfettered footage, if you will. And I'll just be watching myself play this game in my software editing. Or in my editing software. And then I'll forget, right, I need to be editing the software, not not watching this intently. It's mostly because of the power washing. Okay, now we can start on the floor.
I always wanted to work with a power washer until I actually worked with a power washer. Yeah, they're, they're not as fun as they are in this game. I hear there's quite a lot of vibrations that kind of leaves you shaking for the rest of the day. For tool making shit clean, it is very dirty work. Yeah, you kind of get all wet. And whatever dirt you're cleaning off kind of gets on everything or you. It just means you need to vibrate with the same frequency as the power washer so it cancels out. Yeah, that's why you keister a, uh, a, uh, Hitachi in your, in your buttocks. Pro tip. Exactly. Yeah, I, I know what I'm talking about. Says man with absolutely no sexual experiences. Okay, we're going to take our opportunity to have a tea and a chat. And here we're actually going to start talking a bunch. So, so my tea doesn't get cold and it's already kind of feeling, a, oh, it's still hot. That's good. So we're going to have our tea while it's still hot and we'll have a chat while we're doing it. So, I have begun, I have finished, however, yet to test, I have finished the weapon overhaul patch for Beyond Skyrim Bruma, you know, following my own overhaul. And, um, I have begun work on the armor patch for Beyond Skyrim Bruma. However, I don't know what's going on with Beyond Skyrim Bruma's armor. Because the ESP has the, like, various guard armors from the regions in Bruma. But the BSA that I extracted the files from didn't have the actual armor files. So the ESP is pulling NIF files that aren't there. So all the armors, not all of them, but most of the armors, including about 90% of the guard armors, um, are showing up invisible, which, you know, it's not, it's not the way it's supposed to work. So I need to see if I can re-download Beyond Skyrim Bruma to get the missing guard models. Because the thing is, I want to see what they look like before I go changing them. Because with a lot of Bruma's weapons, quite a lot of them look pretty good for a historically accurate, realistic medieval setting. Like, because, you know, that's what medieval Skyrim is. We're trying to make it very realistic. Especially in the aesthetic. So it's going to be kind of hard to, uh, you know, replace those armors when I don't have an idea of what those armors originally look like. So I'm going to see if I can tool around and see if I can't find those files somewhere. Because either the BSA didn't include them or when it was installed, it didn't install all the files. Or 
that when extracting the BSA, it excluded some files. Which still wouldn't make sense, since I still have the BSAs and the loose files, and the files are still showing up as invisible. So, it's kind of like... I don't know. I might just have to use the armors from the Medieval Armor Overhaul, a mod I did not make, um, and just kind of go with a generic looking, you know, Bruma Guards. But it's frustrating because there's also the Vaultman 30's uh, Bruma patch, which replaces the Bruma armor with various historically accurate armors, but with custom textures, show it, so it shows the actual guards insignia. So like, if it's, if it's a coral guard, it shows the coral coat of arms. So when the rest of the armors are either not covered by the Vaultman 30's patch, or are just showing up as invisible, it's a little... It's not frustrating, but it's, it's frustrating in the sense of I have nothing to go off of. So I may just have to, um, like, Google search the image of the armor and then, um, replace it with the medieval armor overhaul guards armors that, um, uh, uh by color. Almost done with the tea. Hi, Remy. You're so cute today. He's sleeping on his blanket square. Or rather, he just laid down, but... Yeah. In other news, I'm still working on d, &D stuff. I'm converting... I'm converting uh, a D&D adventure by the name of the Drow War. It is in three parts, each part being a big adventure all on its own. And the big adventures split up into ten smaller adventures. And they're all part of the same story, so it's not just an amalgamation of adventures that you can put your characters through. Because there are adventures like that where it's not really a it's not really a single linear story so much as it is here's a setting and here's some things they can do. But with the Drow War, it's like I said, it's a single linear story. Um, but it just is comprised of ten mini parts which are inside each part, which there are three in total. And the idea is to get the players from level 1 to level 30 or higher. The only problem with that is I'm converting it to 5e, which only goes up to level 20. However, I can always do it that whenever they quote-unquote level up, um, that they get an epic boon instead. And I think because it's a pre-written, and the fact that um, I'd be converting it to 5e, you know, meticulously balancing the encounters around 5e, I think the DM burnout will be minimal. Because if it was a custom campaign going from level 1 to level 30, then it'd be huge DM burnout possibility. But the only burnout I'll, I'll get is converting the adventure, which more or less is just copy and paste. Like, I, I am scribing it down into a Google document. And the reason I'm doing it on Google Docs is because then I can access it on my phone because I don't have a working laptop. And we don't do D&D &D at my apartment because my apartment's too small. So I can't just... And I can't just bring my desktop over to the, over to another person's apartment every other week or so. So, I'm, I'm going to be loading it up on my phone in Google Docs and then just doing it that way. I also, to kind of take a break from the Drow War conversion... Sorry, drinking the tea. Um, I started working on the continuous conversion of the arms and equipment guide for 
but converting it to 5e. Which I am not done copying and pasting what I have so far in my document, but I'm also doing that and working on my Bruma patch and working on rendering videos, which takes minimal editing effort because I'm not actually properly editing the videos. I'm just kind of splicing clips together. Um, and I'm also uploading the videos to YouTube. And I'm also making sure the videos go public. Because I don't just upload it and make it public right away. And I'm trying to follow some sort of schedule on the, you know, video release. And I'm also streaming, so I'm very, very busy. You know, for someone who doesn't have a job or school, I'm very busy. So, and I, I will once again take this opportunity to talk about D&D, and I don't want to complain about it the whole time, so I'm going to talk about good stuff. Have to charge my phone, but I'll keep it in the same room as your clean to the kitchen for some D&D discussion while cleaning. Very nice. Of course, if you have to go for any particular thing, you know you're not you're not tied to the channel. You're, you're not you're not leash and collared to keep me happy. So if people ever have to leave to do something important, such as cleaning, then by all means. But if you're still able to watch, it is very much appreciated. Alright, so. What do I want to talk about for D&D? I don't know what I want to talk about for D&D. Oh, I have a session on this Saturday. So I'm going to have to spend some time to kind of go over my notes tomorrow. Am I not legally obliged to stay here forever and ever and ever? I'm here because I enjoy the stream very much. Well, yes, I appreciate it. I just don't want people to feel like they're... They're expected to be here, because then that's not fun for anyone. That, and I'm also paranoid about how people perceive me. Yay, paranoia. That and I genuinely don't want people to feel like they're expected to be here. Yay, paranoia gang. For the most part it's it's uh it's not crippling because I'm very, very heavily medicated. cleaning this because it's like a gradient of, of dirt.
Let's see, D and D. What do I want to talk about? I still very much want to get my online crew uh, into D and D three point five. I'm just scared that I'll scare them off because D&D 3.5 is not as easy to use as, say, 5e, especially from a player's perspective. And I know I'm not going to get my my IRL crew to play 3.5 with with me as the DM. Because the last time I ran 3.5 with them as the DM, I don't think I don't think they think that I did it on purpose. But I'm very much a stickler for the rules in 3.5. Like we have to follow what the rules say because. That's what they say, and I was very much following the rules to a T, but it led to, uh, like, a high-stress series of sessions because of, um, you know, the fact that several players died in one session simply from just falling. And I think... I think they know that I really like 3.5, but they also know that they don't... Well, it's not that they know that. It's more like they don't necessarily like 3.5 as much as I do. And I certainly don't want to force them to play 3.5 if they don't want to. But I also very much... Do not enjoy vanilla 5e from a Dungeon Master's perspective. Since, you know, there's not a whole lot of DM support in, in the rule books, especially in the Dungeon Master's Guide, you know, the book where that's supposed to be the thing. Um, and, and this isn't complaining about... 5e. It's, it's a fact. There's really not much in the way of DM support in the official rule books, And it's a shame because DM... The, there's a DM shortage, as it's called, in, in 5th edition right now. And, um... Like, and, it, and especially since Wizards of the Coast is trying to push for a virtual tabletop setting. You know, where one of the lead persons is literally calling the D&D rule books, specifically physical books, more of collector's items and not actual, like, practical use. Um... And they're pushing for microtransactions in their virtual tabletop, which, you know, granted, has yet to release. And they're also pushing the idea of single-player D&D campaigns in their virtual tabletop space with quote-unquote AI DMs. Where instead of, instead of having an actual flesh-and-blood human... Uh, running your game, it is basically playing a D&D session as a video game because you're going with a, a CPU at DM. And while that's not, like, on surface level, that's not the worst thing that could happen, but considering how they plan to go with it and considering they're going the way of the video game industry, which, oh gee, I don't know why. Is it because their CEO is an ex-Microsoft person? Couldn't possibly be that. But they're going the way of the video game industry, so... It's very easy to see where they go would go with that. 
and basically it's gonna be, you know, instead of actually doing something to repair the DM shortage in the, in the community, they're just making the shortage that much broader by, by supposedly wanting to make a virtual tabletop space where they can sell you microtransactions and AI DMs, which completely guts the heart and soul out of the game. Yeah, at that point, just play Baldur's Gate. You know, Baldur's Gate is literally built off the D&D rule set. You know? And I think mostly it's for people who don't have a group of friends to play with, and they might be... They might be scared of trying to find an online group of strangers. And that, hey, you can at least still play the game to try it out and before you actually get invested into joining a group. Because it can be scary for those who you know, are a little more socially awkward or, or more introverted. And that I understand. So, so like, if that's the case... I'm fine with that, but that's not what they're going with. They're going with AI DMs and microtransactions for your for the for the miniature that will represent your character in the in the virtual tabletop space. So instead of it being a tool for the socially awkward, it is a instead a uh, metaverse kind of thing, not literally, but you know you get the idea. And I totally understand when people are like, you know, they don't want to play without a group of friends, but they don't have a group of friends. Uh, because playing with a group of friends is so much better than playing with a bunch of strangers. Which is one of the reasons the DM burnout I experienced in a previous online campaign, I'm not experiencing with my current online campaigns. Because I'm pretty much playing with a bunch of friends. And my IRL crew is pretty much comprised entirely of friends. Like, there's there's a somewhat newish guy who... <laughs> ...has been playing with us for a few sessions now, but... ...I don't personally know all that well, but we're friendly. But he's friend... is obviously friends with everybody else so you know we're, we're more or less again playing with a bunch of friends and that makes it so much easier to run slash play together Ooh, big air. need up here dad who's dad we'll never know what am I is it the f yep it's the floor it's the floor with the dragon. Speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, here's a literal dragon. Right here.
trying to stand back up. The game's not letting me. I gotta move the ladder. But I, I, I'm getting reinvigorated to work on my quote-unquote homebrew, which is, you know, mostly just converting old stuff. And, um... And I'm looking forward to working on more of it. Because even when it comes to homebrew, I think my IRL crew would rather just play with the rules as, they're, as they are. Which is like another reason why I'm probably not going to run a custom campaign for them in 5e. Because it's too much work for very little payout. You know, not literal payout, but, you know, like, how much I emotionally get out of the game versus how much they emotionally get out of the game. Because, in my opinion, 5e is too easy for the players, while incredibly difficult for the DM to run. And my, my position as a DM is not to kill the players... But I don't want to set up combat encounters where the per where pretty much every combat encounter is the players win without hardly a struggle at all. Because at that point, it's like, why even give them combat encounters to begin with? Gotta drink some water real quick. Finish the head of the dragon before I do that. And I already don't like that they changed quite a lot of the lore of the different monsters. As far as like orcs and stuff, I'm I'm pretty okay with that change, which isn't so much a change of the orcs per se, just that they made it so that fantasy races are not just inherently evil because traditionally in, in old fantasy stories they are, but you know, it's like, okay, I'm okay with that, that that's fine. But they changed some of the lore of actual monsters to be a little more family friendly. And I'm not talking about like, you know, they changed it from previous 5e publications or like they made an addendum on a post or something. No, I'm talking about like from 3.5 where the monsters were or maybe even before. And then they put it in 5e as like, oh, here's a uh, an extra monster manual thing. Uh, book thing book and here's the monster from an older edition like, oh cool and then you read the lore of it and it's like oh it's just generic fantasy instead of the horrible terrifying undead monstrosity that is the one creature I'm specifically talking about which is the Alip the Alip is a spiritual undead that is the crazed spirit of a person who was driven to madness in life and you know when they died they became a horrible spirit in fifth edition 
it's kind of the same, but not really. They made it just so, oh, they they uncovered some eldritch unknown secret, and then they went mad from it, as if D&D was Call of Cthulhu or something, which it's not. And, and then the, instead of making them interesting by, you know, having their abilities that they mostly had in 3.5, but instead, you know, making it for 5e, they just made it so that, eh, it just does damage. The Alep in 3.5 didn't do hit point damage. It damaged your wisdom score. So if your wisdom score went to zero from an Alep, you died. And in 5e, it just... It, because they have the new damage type of psychic damage, it does psychic damage to you if, if it hits you. When the whole thing of the Alep is it tries to hit you with its attacks, which just pass right through your body, but the Alep doesn't know that it can't hurt you, but it's trying to. But the, the touch attacks from the Alep make your wisdom, wisdom score go down, which is like if it goes to zero, you're in deep shit. So not only do they make undead less interesting by just making it a generic enemy type that doesn't have anything special for being its actual type, um, but they also made spiritual, like, you know, non-physical undead, kind of like the ghosts in Skyrim where you can just run up and hit it with a sword. Which is not how it used to work. And people would always use the excuse for old old mechanics not be, being in 5e of, oh, it was too complicated back then. Oh, so we're just gonna give up and not try to make the mechanic work in a simpler way for 5e? That's bullshit, and you know it. Because I've been able to add mechanics to 5e with some previous homebrew, and it's still simple and easy to use. Very human, very easy to use. And it's just like like they couldn't figure it out, really. They, they just couldn't figure it out. I figured it out in like 15 minutes. <laughs> what? You telling me they couldn't just figure it out? And and the thing is, they have figured out how to design things for 5e. So why don't they just add more mechanics to give it more, you know, mechanical depth? But again, I'm going to use the Skyrim analogy. It's just like Skyrim. Where mechanically, it's about as deep as a puddle. And the, the thing about Skyrim is, it's incredibly easy, well, it's not easy, but you know what I mean. The, the modding community for Skyrim makes it so that you can pretty much turn Skyrim into anything. And that's one of 5e's strengths, is the system is so simple and basic that making homebrew for it, while not necessarily super easy, can be done in a, in a, you know, much simpler fashion other than just, um, or other than in, like, say, 3.5, where if you, if you had one, if you made a homebrew thing that had just one bonus that was a, a skew, then it could lead to horribly, horribly, horribly unbalanced, overpowered homebrew. Plus, the rules are more complex in 3.5, so making homebrew for that system is just, by nature, going to be more difficult. But since 5e is pretty basic and simple, making the homebrew is a little bit easier than in, say, 3.5. Now, I've, I'm pretty sure we're over this hump. I'm pretty sure whenever somebody makes homebrew these days, they actually have decent balance. But that's the thing with D&D 5e homebrew that is different 
uh, than say 3.5 is it's easy to make the homebrew for 5e. It's incredibly hard to balance it properly. Uh, so in the early days of 5e homebrew, nobody really knew how to balance it, so they didn't even try. So that led to a whole bunch of incredibly overpowered uh, homebrew. Like, you know, a subclass getting a whole class's worth of abilities. Or a race basically having as many racial features as some classes do class features. But nowadays, the homebrew is usually pretty, pretty decent quality. Of course, you're still going to come across, like, bad homebrew. But for the most part, the, the homebrew that gets all the attention is the high quality stuff. So that's one thing I like about 5e, it's it's easy to make the homebrew and hard to balance, but everyone's kind of figured out the balance at this point, or, or, the, or how to balance a, a, a rule. So, I, I quite like the idea that d and 5e is very malleable as Skyrim is. That Skyrim is so malleable because it's incredibly simple. And 5e is so malleable that it because it's so simple. But I think the problem with 5e is not only is it incredibly flawed, uh, but you have a large part of the community acting like it's not flawed at all or that what they think is flawed is actually one of the things that make 5e unbearable to someone like me or excuse me what they think is not flawed is what i find unbearable well spell casting isn't overpowered at all the gap between spell casters and martial characters is really not there Player characters aren't overpowered, you're just bad at making encounters. So why don't you redesign the entire monster manual and also be a master tactician? Gee, I don't know, I don't I don't know why I don't do that. Maybe it's because I'm busy writing an entire campaign and trying to have interesting NPCs that are deep and complex and trying to run a game that you know, it's not as easy as it seems, while also having to narrate. I, basically, being a DM is like being a, being an entire crew for a TV show or movie, but you're doing it by yourself. Welcome in, Vescu. Hello. Hey there, Failer. Monkey, indeed. How you doing today, Vescu? You know, I said I wouldn't complain about D&D today, but here I am. <laughs> Almost like clockwork. I I swear I'm not going to get angry about D and D whenever I talk about D and D Kappa. But I don't enjoy the idea that the community has of the DM should just do more work, when for the most part, older editions had this stuff figured out. Oh, tactics for the monster? We'll just look under the combat tactics for the monster in the monster's entry on this page. And it's like, why doesn't 5e have that? 
the community just acts like it should, the DM should just be a should just be a magical calculator. Like like figure it out, DM. We're not going to help, but we're going to demand you figure it out. Meanwhile, the rule books mostly just say the same thing. Lamau, just figure it out. It's like, fuck's sake, no wonder there's a DM shortage. And no wonder most DMs are switching to Pathfinder. <laughs> the, the, like, D&D is just really not good. At least not D&D 5e. The only problem with D&D 5e is I feel like I'm stuck with it. Because my IRL crew... It, it is very much a tyranny of majority kind of thing. They don't want to play in 3.5. But I don't want to play in... Or run in 5e. I wouldn't mind giving playing a try. But even when I was playing at one point, I was playing in Eldritch Knight. And because of the way the story went for my character, I felt... Like, I was kind of expect... Not necessarily expected, but like I should be dual-wielding. Which, as an Eldritch Knight, again, using the Skyrim parallel, you're not dual-wielding. You're casting a spell in one hand and using a weapon in the other. Although it's not completely limited to that. That's just the general idea. So, since my character was a longsword-wielding Eldritch Knight, you know, where he can wield longsword in one hand and cast a spell in the other... I felt more useful as a party member by going into combat, getting in the enemy's face, and then dual wielding. Especially since I had the dual wielder feet, so I could dual wield long swords. I know, it's very silly. But that's what, the, for story reasons, I did that. Which basically made me a really shitty spellcaster because I would have to spend my turn casting a buff spell. Then spending my next turn casting a buff spell. And then on my next turn, casting a spell that does less damage than dual wielding. Especially since sometimes I can just action surge. Especially since for the most part, 5e c combat encounters in a single adventuring day are usually one. <laughs> sometimes two every once in a while. So if I action surge, I'm dishing out a shitload of damage while dual wielding. So, why would I ever be a spellcaster at that point? So it just kind of, I kind of just, it kind of just felt shitty that I was more or less being punished by the system for playing to my character's backstory. Especially since the DM just gave it to me. You know, it was like, oh, you fight, you come across a town that's been deserted and destroyed, but here's a dead god, and there's a sword in his skull, but, oh, it looks just like your father's sword, which you're wielding. So I was like, uh, I should, like, I felt like it only made sense that dual wielding would have been a possibility for my character build at that point. And then once I started dual wielding, I'm like, oh. I guess I'm never casting any spells ever again, <laughs> because casting spells was inferior to dual wielding. Granted, dual wielding in 5e is kind of underpowered, and certainly spell casting is much, much stronger than dual wielding. But since Eldritch Knights are quarter casters, which means they are basically wizard light. And they're, they're extremely limited on, on which spells they can choose. Which I think was a missed opportunity. Um, like, I just never found a reason to spellcast. So I was kind of being punished for playing to my character's backstory. Which, since everyone loves to act like D&D 5e is a uh, is a rules light narrative heavy system when it is very much not as much as everyone would like to think it is it's not um it just felt so shitty that 
I was doing a mechanically narrative uh, thing, and the thing I built my character for at the start was being hamstrung. So, I was just like, man. Like, it kind of felt like... I don't want to keep saying shitty, but it felt shitty. That not only did I not have as much strength as even the ranger, because I wasn't going to put all my points in strength, I, you know, I, I had to split my ability scores, so I put some in intelligence so I could actually be decent at spellcasting, and then what did I do? I just dual wielded all the time. So I was I was not as strong as the ranger. I wasn't as I wasn't as useful as a caster as the full caster in the party. So and I was really good at dual wielding. Like I I could do quite a bit of damage as a dual wielder. Like you know, talk about action surge like that's four attacks at the level that we were at. Because we were at 5th level. And in 5e, fighters get 2 attacks at 5th level. So if I action surge, I could do 4 attacks. Because, actually no. If I'm dual wielding, that's 2 attacks, plus a bonus action. So I don't get a second bonus action with action surge, but I get... Two, four, five attacks. Nothing could survive that if all the attacks hit. At least not anything short of a, a boss enemy. But again, it just felt like, for story reasons, I was being rewarded for having a good backstory because the DM just kind of gave me a narrative element. And then... Like, I was just not an Eldritch Knight anymore. I was just a generic dual-wielding fighter. Which the whole backstory for, like, a whole part to my character's backstory was... He stole the rights of Thunder from the Giants. Kind of on, on, on accident, mostly. He stole the rights of Thunder from the Giants... Because he so desperately wanted to be a wizard. He so desperately wanted to prove to everyone that he could cast magic when he was cast out of a mage's university for being unable to cast magic. So he stole the rights of Thunder. And the magic he could cast at you know at, from that point forward mostly was lightning magic. But I wasn't doing that. I was dual wielding. Now I'm sure you could say, oh, well, the system didn't... It's not the system's fault that the DM gave you a narrative story element that you felt to you needed to take a, a feat for, an optional feat. But it was also kind of like, the system doesn't help. Because even as a player, it's st I'm still frustrated by the system. Back with food. Welcome back. Anyways. What I'm trying to say is 5e is deeply flawed... But some of the more hard hardcore members of the player base act like it's not. Which is more frustrating than killing, almost getting a TPK from climbing uh, in 3.5. When, you know, again, my goal as the DM is not to kill my players. In fact, I'm almost as invested in my character's growth and story potential as the players themselves. So I don't want to kill them simply because 
well, there's that story thread just gone. But I don't want them to win every combat encounter with hardly a struggle. Because, like, it doesn't seem to matter what encounter you're making. Because I've seen, I've seen much, much lower level party members defeat a higher level enemy. It just took three hours to do it. Which is exhausting for everyone involved, including the players. So it was extremely frustrating. Get me up here, Todd. I know you didn't make this game, Todd, but get me up here, Todd. What is this Mickey Mouse shit? Hanging off the side, I gotta get off. Eh, there we go. Gotta check. Okay, that one's done. Put it over there, out of the way. Actually, we need to clean this. What is this Mickey Mouse shit? Getting stuck on everything. And the main thing I, I, I think I'm criticizing 5e for that it's not exactly 5e's fault, but it is 5e's fault. Wizards of the Coast hasn't released any other kind of setting in a while. They've released Spelljammer, which they did horribly. But D20 Modern became a footnote for 5e because they released modern rule settings in an article they released online and then just proceeded to make it a well here's magic it's like no magic in a modern setting should be 
optional. Like, you know, if it fits the setting. The default assumption for a modern setting should be that, you know, it's... Doesn't have magic? Gee, gee, can, can anything in 5e please just not have magic? But again, they release it as a as an article, not an actual rule setting. Come at the ladder and straight away. And they certainly haven't tried to make anything resembling a, a historically accurate medieval setting. Everything's got to be fantasy. Everything's got to be kitchen sink, ultra hyper fantasy with a focus on fan service for the players. And no, I don't mean that kind of fan service. I'm talking like actual fan service. Like, the players get to be their ultimate overpowered OCs. Because the rules just let them. Ah, this, this section is a little jank. Getting stuck on everything. At least Remy's comfy on his little blanket square. Like, I would love to see another setting besides Dragonlance, or Eberron, or Faerun. Can we have a little bit of variety? Other than just, here's fantasy setting C, here's fantasy setting B. Can we have a little more variety? I'm not saying they have to turn around and no longer do fantasy, especially since it is D&D. It's just... It's, can, can, we, can we try something else? And that's mostly my complaint with 5e. Lack of variety. And I'm just... I'm just... I, I have a D&D &D fatigue. Like, I, I'm fatigued by 5e. Because it's all I've had for the last however many years since 2014. I was playing d d 5e since before I went to college the second time. That's a long time. And I'm just fatigued by the system. And I want something else. Now, of course, I could just switch to Pathfinder. But... I don't know if I want to try Pathfinder 2e. I, I kind of want to try Pathfinder 1e. And at that point, why don't I just go to 3.5? The answer is because my IRL crew doesn't want to play in 3.5. Despite the fact that we're playing in 3.5 in our current campaign. And granted, I'm not running it, but... We're, I think we're going to come back to this and finish this off. This might be a three-parter level.
kind of getting focused on the on the map now. Okie dokie, now I'm going to vacuum the shower. Thanks for the amazing stream and hope you have a good day. Well, thank you for stopping by, Oliver. I appreciate it. We'll see you around. Hopefully you'll be uh, a little more free so you can enjoy life a little bit. But we will certainly see you around next time. Definitely try to catch more streams. Well, I appreciate it. Hope you have a good day. There might be hidden dirt underneath, perhaps. Arms going to sleep. Okay.
Okay. Gonna have to go after the windmill now, I think. The windmill of swords. But yeah, that's more or less where my complaints come from. With D&D 5e is... I'm just tired of the system. I'm tired of always having to fix... Fix the game. When I know it's perfectly within Wizards of the Coast capability of fixing it. They just don't. Or perhaps worse yet, they just they just think 5e is completely fine, and that it requires no fixing, despite the fact that there's thousands of homebrew to fix the problems with the game. I'm not saying they shouldn't be proud of their work. I'm just saying it's possible that they think 5e is completely fine, that they have no reason to touch up on the rules to make sure that things are balanced. Like, I think I, I think I'm just ready for a different system. Even if that system is D and D three point five, I think I'm just ready for something else. Hold on, I think I saw something. And realize they were were individual pieces. Kind of makes it a little more frustrating. Get me on this fence, please. Providing a challenge. It's like the vibration on my phone is getting louder. There, I think all the windmill blades are clean. And that's another thing about D&D 5e homebrew and kind of why I don't want to do it anymore. I just I just want to go back to creating worlds and characters and and interesting settings and not constantly fixing 5e. 
In fact, I'm not even sure I want to convert some stuff to 5e anymore. Of course, I say that and then I'll feel like I want to. But I'm very much like, I just want to stop fixing the game and go to a system that I know works. And I'll leave the 5e stuff to the people that want 5e. I'm just so ready to wash my hands of 5e. Very much, very much don't enjoy this system anymore. See, I enjoy running it when I actually run it. But it's not because of the system. It's because I'm playing with friends. Not unlike video games, really. Most video games I, I play with friends, I'm enjoying it, not because the game is fun, but I'm having fun with my friends in spite of the game. Like, I want to spend... I want to spend my time on D&D &D outside of running it to work on... Gee, I don't know, the towns and cities and characters in the campaign I'm running that's a custom campaign. I haven't worked I haven't worked on my setting in a very very long time and honestly I'd like to get back to it Like, I want to give 5e so many chances because I want to want my players to have fun. But their fun shouldn't come at the expense of my fun. And vice versa.
I got a sneeze coming. I can feel it. I just want to jump. I just I just want to be able to move. It really is like Skyrim.
can feel that sneeze coming again. There's a big one. Ah. Okay, we're ninety one percent of the way clean. So I think uh, this is going to take us a good bit of time still. So we'll finish off the mushroom house. Okay, Mushroom House is done. We're going to continue this uh, next time we play, which I think we're going to pick this up again tomorrow. It's been a good stage. It's just been big and there's a lot of stuff. But we're not quite done with the flooring. I want to finish this off because otherwise I will forget. Now we're done for the day.